Welcome back, everybody. Really nice to be here together tonight for our week five class. And we'll probably, let's wait another minute or so. But even as we're settling, finding the posture that's going to be good enough tonight, we can contemplate this really straightforward question. How do I know there's a body here? What is it in my experience that reveals or says there's a body? So in a way with our course on mindfulness of the body, we're learning to sustain this perception. There is a body. How do I know there's a body? Because this is being known or this is being felt that direct and immediate sense of embodiment. And you'll see with the guided meditation tonight, we'll cover some of the same ground as last week. You'll see it's, it can be very useful to use thought or concepts because what we're doing with these teachings, these concepts, or you could call them a map, we're using them as a kind of counterbalance to the ways we tend to be unaware of the body or disconnected or imagining the body as something that actually doesn't really line up with reality so much. So we're correcting habits of mind and we're using teachings, concepts, a conceptual map to help us transform our understanding our way of perceiving, our way of connecting with the body. But to begin, let's do what we usually do at the beginning, excuse me, of our classes. We'll chant slowly the traditional three refuges in the Pali language. Basically, if you're unfamiliar, we're chanting, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, we do that three times. And Buddha is really, when we use that word, we're really bringing to heart this quality of the mind that is awake, that's capable of being open, clear, receptively knowing it's like this. When we take refuge in Dhamma each time, each of the three times, we're remembering that I value being intimate with the way it is, with the conditions that are moving, that are expressing themselves in my life right here, right now, through the six sense gates, through my five physical senses, through the thinking and imagining mind. This is is the activity of Dhamma. So we take refuge in Buddha, the wakefulness, being awake to Dhamma, the way it is, what's moving, what's coming and going. And we take refuge in Sangha. We're aspiring to live, to engage, to show up in all the little and big ways that we show up in our worlds from this intimacy of Buddha knowing Dhamma. And so The presumption, which we all, each of us have to check out for ourselves is that it really supports skillfulness when we can live from this place of Buddha being intimate with Dhamma. Instead of having a plan of how I should be Mark and what I should do and what I shouldn't do, this kind of conceptual overlay of who I think I am and how I think I should behave, the strategy that comes out of early Buddhism is 
really emphasize this, these first two refuges of take, you know, taking refuge, deeply valuing the capacity to be awake, to be open, to be sensitive, to see and feel clearly and deeply to the way it is, to what's actually here, not on the surface, but both the breadth and the depth of what's moving internally, externally, wanna, not, and not to rush to define our experience, but to stay in that being awake to the way it is. And then just check out like, how am I responding? How are those choices that are being made? Do they turn out to be relatively or even very skillful and nimble and creative and resilient, these ways of engaging my world, my communities, my relationships? And that's the third refuge of Sangha, this enlightened or wise or compassionate engagement in our lives. And these are the three refuges. And because this Monday night Buddhist studies class and the series of classes are really about being a student of these teachings and this person and the wise people who have, you know, done their own interpretations and sharing of these teachings over so many centuries, you know, it's a way of aligning with other people who are finding real value in these teachings, these ancient teachings. So let's do that together to begin our time. And then we'll do a guided sit using some of the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of the body. Listen to the body, making any adjustments that might be needed, cultivating a stable, soft, relatively upright posture that supports alertness and relaxation. And we're just doing the best we can 
coming to a relative stillness in the body, settledness. And take the time to take a few longer, deeper breaths in and out. Let it be these breaths, let them be gentle, but deep. So there's that sense of filling the lungs, emptying the lungs, and just feeling that in the body. In a way, each breath in, each breath out is like a massage for the whole body. And as if we have all the time in the world, we'll do a few more of these longer, easy, deeper breaths. Not at all in a hurry. And we allow the breathing eventually just to move on its own. Grateful that the bodily breathing process doesn't depend on me being in control or managing it. And one of the ways the Buddha suggested that we can balance and even in a sense correct how we relate to the body is to learn how to bring the mind or learn how to experience the body as different parts. And he used very ordinary image of a bag filled with different seeds, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, peas, lentils, rice, things like that. So we're going to move through the body. We'll begin at the head. And for the first scan down through the body, we're just going to keep bringing to mind the reality of skin, something quite ordinary. So we begin to feel and notice the forehead. And just sensing, you can use your imagination as well, of course. Just sensing the truth, there's skin here at the forehead. Skin. And in a way that feels helpful, you can even repeat the word skin silently in your own heart if it's helpful. And along the scalp, there's the hair of the head, of course, and skin. Even the ears covered in skin, back of the head, of course, skin. And down through the face, just aware of the skin, the air touching the skin. The lips, slightly different kind of skin. Inside of the mouth, a more sensitive kind of skin. And we bring to mind the neck, the throat, just as it is. But in particular, we're keeping in mind the reality of skin. And depending on your age, the skin around the neck might be taut or it might be flabby, but it's just skin. Sides and back of the neck, top of the shoulders, 
and the skin around the shoulder joints. Sensing, imagining the skin here, down both arms, possibly some hair of the body, for example, under the arms and along the forearms. And the skin around the palms, maybe slightly calloused along the fingers and back of the hands. Lots of skin. And then nails on the fingers, just a more hardened type of skin. And let's bring the attention to the upper torso. First, the front side, the chest. So from the shoulders down the front side, sensing the skin here. Some skin sensitive, some skin less sensitive. Here the body if there is any down the uh, abdomen, all the way down through the groin, just aware of the skin, skin of the body. And we're learning to be attentive to skin as just an ordinary part of the body. And then beginning at the back of the shoulders, and sensing the skin along the upper back and under the arms and the sides of the ribs. Through the mid back, down the lower back, the buttocks, sits bones, maybe slightly different skin, maybe places of callus. Just sensing the skin around the pelvis. And the hair of the body around the groin and then the skin along both thighs. Maybe the skin's a little tighter around the knees if they're bent, just notice, sense that. Along the calves and shins. The skin around the ankles the more callous skin down by the heels, sides and bottoms of the feet, tops of the feet, the nails of the feet, skin. And take a moment just sensing the body, surface of the body, just skin. Just ordinary skin. And now coming up from the bottoms of the feet, we're going to attune to the sense, the experience of flesh. Use your imagination. And remember, it's not about feeling disgusted. It's really the Buddha suggesting we have a very ordinary, neutral, sense of all the more fleshy parts of the body. So it's some combination of using the concept in your mental image, your imagination and the felt sense of flesh. So we'll begin with the toes. And of course, under the skin, just sensing and imagining the flesh there in the toes the pads of the feet, the bottoms of the feet. 
all the muscle and flesh as you move your awareness up from the feet through the ankles and the thicker muscles in the calves, the juicy, meaty part of the body. And of course, there's all kinds of fluids in the joints, joints of the knees, and the fleshy parts of the thighs. Just sensing the weight of the fleshy parts, the mass around the groin and in the pelvis all the different glands and organs here in the lower abdomen, the different membranes that maintains the internal order and location of all the fleshy parts, the diaphragm, all the web of musculature, the big lungs, the amazing pump of the heart there. And even the juicy parts in the center of the spine, the fluid, spinal fluid, up to the neck, down both arms, feeling the musculature there and the arms, the fleshy parts, including down to the hands, even the little pads of the fingers are fleshy. Of course, it's the most obvious natural thing that there's flesh, lots of flesh, lots of juicy parts here in the body, of course. It's not disgusting, it's not attractive, it's just what it is, flesh. And up through the neck and the skull, the brain is fleshy, the glands here, the eyeballs, Lots of flesh, just flesh. And just taking a moment as we sense and imagine the whole body, we're just clear about all the fleshy parts. We don't need to name every part. Just grounding in the reality of flesh. And of course there are bones. So we'll begin again at the top of the head. And again, using both your felt sense of the body, but also your imagination and the concepts. And we just sense the skull itself, the shape, the hardness, the bridge of the nose, structure of the jaw, the hardness of the teeth, and just sensing, imagining how the spine comes up to the base of the skull, and just sensing the vertebra, the upper part of the vertebra and the collarbones and the upper ribs and the shoulder joints and the bones of the arms and the elbows and the forearms and the more complex skeletal structure in the wrists and in the hands and each finger, all the little bones, 
all of them hard, all of them tied together with the tendons and ligaments, wrapped around with muscle often, bones, lots of bones there in the arms, shoulder area, neck and head. And we sense the whole rib cage as best we can, just use the imagination, lots of bones, of course, cartilage as well. This amazing structure of bones held together and the spine down through the center connecting with the structure of the pelvis, the skeletal structure here in the pelvis, quite large, the bones, hip sockets, big thigh bones, sits bones, the structure of the knees, down through the lower legs, down all the way to the, through the ankles to the heels and all the skeletal structure in both feet, the toes, lots of bones. Lots of bones, imagining, sensing the whole body skeletal structure, the whole body. And learning to relate, to sense the bones in this neutral, ordinary way, neither beautiful, but also not disgusting in any way. It's just bones, just bones. We have the skin and the hair of the body and the hair of the head and the nails. We have all the fleshy parts, the meaty and juicy parts of the body. And we have the skeletal, skeletal structure, all the bones. And you might even notice a kind of coolness. So we'll have a little silence and you can just rotate through those three perceptions. Find your own way, take care of yourself. If, you're, if it's feeling intense in any way, you can just go to whole body awareness or awareness of breath. But if it feels appropriate, just rotate imagining and sensing the skin for a few seconds until it feels clear. And then sensing and imagining the flesh throughout the body until it's clear. And then the bones or skeletal structure until it's clear. And then back through it again. So let's continue on our own for a while. And don't be shy if it's helpful, use the word almost like a meditation word or a mantra. So use the word skin, flesh, 
problems at a pace in a way that ha- seems helpful. This is a good example of where we can use concepts, words, to support a more honest, deep connection with reality, the reality of the body. And the Buddha recommends, you know, in a way that is helpful, not in a way that's disturbing or agitating, but in a way that's really balancing and settling, that we not only learn how to have this perception internally, the body as these ordinary parts, but also externally with our family members, with our friends. It's not a way of dismissing our love or our concern for those around us, but just understanding that the body, my body, this body, their body, skin, flesh and bones, So you can just play with that for the last minute or so. See who comes to mind, might be a neighbor, might be somebody at work, might be your partner, could even be your pet. But just remember as you think of their body, that like much like our body, skin, flesh, and bones. And interestingly, bodies that we find very attractive for whatever reasons, skin, flesh, and bones. And bodies that we don't find attractive, also just skin, flesh, and bones. This is just how it is.
So take a moment, open your eyes, stretch. <clears throat> so once again, welcome everyone. Nice to be here together right in the middle of our eight-week class on the Buddha's teachings on mindfulness of the body. And we're using the discourse on mindfulness immersed in the body, but also, and maybe even more so, the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha's discourse on mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feeling, mindfulness of mind, and mindfulness of mental objects. Sometimes it's translated as, and just to give those of you who are going to be continuing. So in the spring, we'll do mindfulness of feeling tone. That's the second part of the Satipatthana, the, how the Buddha talked about mindfulness. In the summer, the course will be mindfulness of the mind. And in, in the fall, mindfulness of dhammas is how it's usually left untranslated but it's really the study of the awakening factors, the hindrances and the awakening. So it's mindfulness of the awakening process and what gets in the way of the awakening process. So the Buddha is basically saying to be a functional human being and to learn how to relate in skillful and compassionate ways. We need to learn how to be intimate with the body, which is what we're studying this winter. We have to learn how to be intimate with feeling tone. That's what we'll study in the spring. We have to be able to be intimate, clearly aware of the mind, the quality of the mind, tight mind, loose mind, concentrated mind, distracted mind. We need to be able to see that, to know that as it actually is. And then when we're, we've developed this ability to be mindfully aware of what's gross all the way to what's subtle. Then we look at the body and mind in terms of awakening, liberation, more and more freedom, and what's in the way. And that's the fall work that we'll do. And that's called mindfulness of tamas. Usually it's left untranslated, as I said. And so, as I mentioned uh, briefly last week, the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of the body in the Satipatthana Sutta are really contemplations. We're using concepts. We're using maps to help transform how we see, how we relate, how we know the body. So um, this one that we started last week and we're working on tonight, and I'll try to get to uh, introduce the next one, mindfulness of the elements before we end tonight. But with mindfulness of the anatomical parts that we've been talking about these last two weeks, we're really, you know, because the very deep habit is we think of the body and we relate to my body and to everybody else's body in terms of its kind of superficial shape. You know, it's amazing how even with our masks on, if we see a friend walking, especially here in Minnesota, all bundled up with the coat and then a mask on top of that, isn't it interesting how quickly we know, oh, that's this person, right? Because we're used to seeing the body and, label, and uh, sort of recognizing it in just a superficial way. There's actually a story from the early discourses where uh, I think it was... Uh, some wife finally got disgusted with their husband and left. And the husband was totally distraught, running around looking for her, where his wife had run away to. And it happened upon a, a practitioner, a, a student of the Buddha, a pretty skilled practitioner um, who has had a, a lot of continuity of mindful awareness along the road. So the husband said to this monk, have you seen this woman? And he described his wife and, uh, you know, she's young, she's beautiful or whatever. However, he described his wife to this monk and the monk said, no, I didn't see anything like that. 
And then uh, before the, the person left, he said, I did see teeth. I did see skin. I did see flesh, you know? So it's like, because he was doing this contemplation, you know, internally with, in terms of my own body, but also externally in terms of anybody that happens by, oh, skin, flesh, bones. You know, we don't see it in terms of, oh, I find this part of this person attractive or, oh, this person I don't find attractive, which is often how we tend to look at people, you know, in terms of like, like the clothes they're wearing, like the shape of the body, don't like the shape of their body, afraid of the age of that body, greedy of the youth of that body, you know, it's just these very superficial things. So to help the heart unhook from these very superficial ways that we relate to the body, check out this contemplation and check it out playfully because, uh, you know, depending on our own, you know how it is in our culture, probably in a lot of cultures these days, there's a lot of, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, toxicity and ignorance, how we've been culturally conditioned to think of bodies and our body in particular. And so there can be a lot of uh, woundedness in terms of our relationship to body. But it doesn't mean we should ignore it. It just means we want to tread carefully and really take responsibility to use these teachings skillfully in a way that promotes balance and a settledness and a harmonizing and integration of our mind with our mind, heart, and body, really coming together in a way so that this integration of mind and body, like being intimate with the body, being embodied, starts to feel safer, less having to be disconnected, operate in a disconnected, in denial, deluded in the sense of being unaware of the body, having an, a deluded or a not accurate connection with the body which is how we, some of us have to survive because there are some significant wounds and pain. And we haven't yet learned how to release, to meet that pain, to forgive ourselves, to forgive whatever needs forgiven, to be forgiven and to help that unwind. And you know, this finally, these last decades, there's just a lot more out there um, especially in Western psychology around how to work with trauma. And there's new fields of psychology really somatically based to help people recognize what's living in the body. Somebody asked this question at the end uh, in the chat last week. And uh, I think it, um, the question was something like, uh, how might uh, it affect us, how, like the trauma that lives in the body, how might it affect us as we do some of these practices? Well, that's for each of us to carefully, gently recognize. And uh, it, it brought to mind a, a powerful quote from Alice Miller. Maybe some of you have heard this. The truth of our childhood is stored up in our body and although we can repress it, we can never alter it. Our intellect can be deceived, our feelings manipulated, our conceptions confused, and our body tricked with medication. But someday our body will present its bill, for it is, a, for it is as incorruptible as a child who, still whole in spirit, will accept no compromise or excuses and it will not stop tormenting us until we stop evading the truth. So a lot of what we'll be learning these next three weeks with uh, body parts meditation, and then before we end tonight, I'll introduce the elements meditation, which is just a, a map we used to have a more intimate, grounded connection with sensation. And then maybe next week, but for sure the week after, we'll do 
uh, some variations of the corpse meditation, but it's basically as we feel and sense the body, realizing its impermanent nature, that however it is now, it's in the process of changing. And there's that obvious trajectory of the physical body of birth, growth, aging, sickness, and death. And that's not specific to any one of us. That's just the very nature of the body to be born, to grow up, to age, to be sick at times, and to eventually die and to fall apart in that dying process, right? To decompose dust to dust. I don't know, some of you probably were <clears throat> raised a Catholic and on um, Ash Wednesday, you know, there was this, you go up and the priest would make a little cross in your forehead with ashes. And, you know, it's really a powerful teaching that that's where we end up. That's where the body ends up decomposed returns to ash and it changes how we relate to the body knowing that oh it's just this body is skin flesh and bones we're not making a big deal of it it's really meant to be grounding or when we work with the elements meditation and we we realize that oh it's hardness or softness or smoothness or roughness or it's warmth or it's coolness or it's movement or it's stillness or heldness, right? It's like we can break down or deconstruct the sensations we're feeling and they're not very special. You know, like we might have a really nice feeling in the body, but it's when we really look at it carefully, not, not in any sort of weird way, just sort of break it down. It's just some combination of hardness and softness and smoothness and roughness and heaviness and lightness in warmth or coolness or movement or stillness and some co cohesion, cohering of all of those different elements together that make this bodily experience this way. And when I'm feeling hardness or lightness or roughness or smoothness, it's really not that different than when you're experiencing hardness or smoothness or lightness or roughness or warmth or coolness. It's not all that personal. So you see that these three maps we're going to use that the Buddha offers us so that we can correct our bad habits in terms of how we relate to the body. Use this sort of map of ordinary body parts. And I, I think I read last week the more traditional. So Venerable Analio, a wonderful teacher of mine and teacher for many of us here in the West, he simplified it. There's a little bit of suggestion to do it this way in the early uh, teachings and the suttas. But he basically came up with this simple way of body scan using the skin and then come back up through the body, keeping in touch, in tune with the flesh and then down being in tune with the bones. And you can repeat that. Um, but uh, the traditional uh, way, the way it is in the discourse, I'll just read. One examines the same body up from the soles of the feet, down from the top of the hair, enclosed by skin, and full of many kinds of impurities. Now that word impurities, is, I'm stopping the reading now, it's really making the point that these different parts are in their essence, not attractive not special. So that's the way to use that word impurity. Nothing special. And, and uh, you'll see when I read the, the simile, like I mentioned in the guided sit, it's just like different seeds. Seeds are not disgusting. We don't really have a strong emotional reaction when we see a lentil or a rice grain or a sesame seed or a sunflower seed, you know, they're just kind of stuff. And this is the simile the Buddha uses. And so now he lists the 32 parts and it's not all inclusive. So it's not like you gotta be, get every single part because we're just challenging a habit of being superficial. So that's why three parts will work. Now we're gonna hear the 32. In this body, there are head hairs. And it, as, even as I go through the 32 parts, 
you can just flash, you know, using your imagination. Okay, a bunch of head hair. Just seeing the head hair as, as one bundle of stuff. Head hairs. Hair of the body. The nails. All of our teeth. Big bundle of skin. An even bigger bundle of flesh. All the sinews. A big pile of bones. The bone marrow. Kidney heart, each of these organs, you know, has a different, slightly different color, liver, the diaphragm, different shape, of course, the spleen, lungs, bowels, mesentery, that's the um, sort of membrane that holds a lot of the digestive or organs against, you know, keeping them in place, basically, contents of the stomach, like what does lunch look like now? Feces, the bile, the phlegm, any pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, snot, oil of the joints, urine. And it's just interesting, like, any emotional response that we felt or just the mind like shutting down or some strong idea like this is really stupid. <laughs> I thought Buddhism was helpful, but this seems just weird. So just be aware of whatever kind of physical, psychological, emotional response arose. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because this is just high school biology, maybe even eighth grade biology or seventh grade biology, you know, learning these basic parts of the body. Oh well, yeah, that's how it is. And the interesting question that I, I'm really encouraging us, especially this week, because in the course of your lifetime, you're not going to get too many invitations like we're getting last week and tonight. Like as you live your day tomorrow, tonight, as you're around yourself, looking in the mirror or with just aware of the body or seeing another body, a pet, someone you're living with, just remember, just like, how does it change things to remember this ordinary truth, like a bag of seeds? Oh yeah, there's this and there's that and there's a bunch of that and some of the stuff is moist and wet and some of the stuff is actually liquid and some of the stuff is quite hard like the bones. Like some things very tough, like the tendons. It's just stuff. And all that stuff together makes up what we call the body. And how does that change how I move through life, how I relate, how I do my stuff as a human being? Because the idea is that it starts to undermine the habit of conceit because one of the things the ego depends on, it, you know, the ego is quite skillful at in one moment be, being identified with one thing and the next moment identified with another thing. So it's very quick in that way, but certainly there are moments when the sense of self is very much attached, identified with the body. Like when your partner says, oh, you look really good today. And then it feels so personal, <laughs> like, oh, we don't think, oh, the skin looks good or the fleshy parts are in the right places, so that looks good. Or the skeletal structure still doesn't seem humped over, seems somewhat upright. That's, we don't think of it that way. We think it's like me who looks good, right? But if we cultivate this perception, it really changes. Like, oh yeah. Like when we see somebody whose body, for whatever reason to us is attractive, you know, it's like, yeah, they've got, the skin is this way. The flesh is shaped in this way. The skeletal structure is this way. And the mind has been conditioned to say, that's nice. You know, and then when we see another body that we have the opposite, oh, that body's not attractive. Oh yeah, it's still skin, flesh, and bones, but it's slightly different, you know, how it's shaped. But it's basically just skin, flesh, and bones. And so here's the simile that goes with, um, this is the next part in that discourse where the Buddha is giving us this meditation on anatomical parts. 
He goes, it, <clears throat> it is just as if a person with good eyes who has opened a double mouthed bag. So the speculation is this is the kind of bag they would, farmers would use when they're seeding the crops where they, a bigger hole on top where they pour all the seeds in and a smaller hole at the bottom of the bag where the seeds would kind of go out a few at a time along the row that the farmer's planting. Um, who has opened a double mouth bag full of different sorts of grain, such as hill rice, red rice, beans, peas, millet, and white, white rice, which they would examine, oh, this is hill rice, this is red rice, these are beans, these are peas, this is millet, and this is white rice. So that's that very ordinary simile the Buddha uses. Like that's the attitude we want <clears throat> in our mind when we do this, this particular meditation on the anatomical parts, whether we do it you know, in a more detailed way, like the 32 parts, or we do it in that more simplistic way we did during the guided meditation, whether you do it formally in your set or you do it informally during the day. And you can just be playful with it. And it's really okay to be creative. Like, you know, you're at work and you just, in a playful way, just remember every person you see, there's a skeleton there covered up by the clothes, by the skin and by the flesh. But there's a skeleton in there. And just see how that changes, how you <laughs> relate to those people at work you really like and those people at work you find difficult to be around. Oh, yeah, it's just part of what's going on here. There's a skeleton there. Somebody asked the question um, in the chat last week. And remember, you can send in your questions to me um, and I'll try to weave them into the class. So if, think, if something comes up during the week around these practices and uh, a question emerges, send it in. Uh, but somebody wrote, I have a body. I am a body. What is your take? <laughs> like, how do we relate? And really what we're doing is we were using conceptual maps to loosen how the mind understands the body from a fixed understanding, basically to a not fixed understanding. Because we can do this practice a lot. It doesn't mean that a, a particular body will walk by and we won't judge it as being very attractive or judge another body as being very unattractive. But with this work, we won't be confused by that habitual conclusion. Oh, this is an attractive body. I like this body, right? But then the mind will go, it will go, yeah, I, I get that experience of attraction. And right there, because of the work we're doing, it's just skin, flesh, and bones. So it really ventilates our habit of seeing things, seeing bodies in terms of attractiveness and unattractiveness including our own body as being attractive or unattractive, right? And this goes back to some of the, um, the harm that's been done to us over the years of our life, um, where, you know, however it might've happened, we've felt really judged and our body has been violated in a way. And so then we might have this habit a, a very strong habit sometimes of disgust or self-hatred related to our bodies. And so this can really help ventilate and loosen if it's done skillfully, if we're really using these practices, we're taking responsibility because nobody can really tell us our internal experience. So we really have to take personal responsibility. Like, is this reflection I'm doing is it in the direction of integration, of healing, of harmonizing the heart, mind, and body? Or is it, is it deepening some self-hatred? Or is stuff arising, strong feelings, emotions arising that I don't know yet how to be with? Because just generally in meditative practice, we're learning two skills, like how to skillfully turn toward our experience 
even if it is intense, even if it is challenging. But we're also learning very essential skill of how to turn away. Like, because what mindful awareness teaches us, like if I'm mindfully aware and something's gotten triggered, some old trauma, some old pain has gotten triggered and is coming to the surface, and there's some balanced present moment awareness, it might reveal, you know what? I don't have sufficient balance, sufficient confidence, su sufficient stability to be with what I'm feeling right now, what I'm experiencing right now. And then wisdom would naturally ask a question, well, what can I be aware of in this moment? Well, maybe I'll go take a walk. Maybe I'll go make a cup of tea. Maybe I'll call a friend, right? So it's precisely because there's some mindful awareness, we might realize, you know what? It's not so easy for me to be relaxed and alert with what's showing up in my experience right now. Okay, maybe I should turn towards some other aspect of the present moment where I actually could be intimate and alert and relaxed with it. What might that be? What, what is available in terms of my, you know, in terms of what's present, what can I pay attention to that is neutral enough or pleasant enough that the mind is able to be clearly aware, relaxed, alert. And uh, one thing, just in terms of the history, that um, it's important to understand with this uh, body part meditation is, uh, you know, at the time of the Buddha and for many centuries, a lot of the people who ended up at monasteries were young, both the nuns and the monks. And uh, so obviously sexual energy is going to be a dominant thing going on. I don't know if some of you are young and most of us can remember being young. And even as we're old, you know, we never stop being a sexual being. We never stop being sexually attractive. And so this was a very specific antidote for strong uh, experiences of sexual attraction. And, uh, you know, I'm guessing most of you know, but certainly seems real in my life. Uh, we can get in a lot of trouble with sexual attraction because you know it's just a force of nature it's a very strong force of nature obviously you know through evolution it's what allows humanity to continue to be on this planet is because of the strong force of sexual attraction and um, you know these days it's uh, how it expresses itself and what's allowed is sort of much more diverse and varied than maybe other times in history, who knows? But it's really still the same force of sexual attraction. And the, the question is like, how can we be a sexual being as we are and not cause ourselves and not cause others harm? How can we navigate this territory? Because repression and denial is really unhealthy and tends to not work <laughs> and acting out our sexual attractions all the time, whenever, just because it's there, we feel we have to do something with that attraction. Well, that doesn't work so well either because sometimes people aren't interested and sometimes people are already in a committed relationship and any number of other reasons why it's not an appropriate thing to express that attraction. So this, this is a specific technique that people, especially people who are practicing celibacy or people in committed relationships. So this is more for us lay folks who aren't necessarily celibate, but maybe are in a committed relationship yet still bumping into folks who we find sexually attractive. 
but you might just experiment, experiment with that a little bit. Like, yeah, I can see this attraction. I can feel this attraction. I'm not afraid of this attraction. And part of the reason I'm not afraid of this attraction is I can see it from another perspective. Because like I said, it isn't that one perspective is true or right. It's that a fixed perspective isn't helpful. We don't want to reinforce this idea that there's a right way to look at a body, our body or another body. No. So these different frames we use skillfully as a kind of medicine to keep the heart, mind, and balance. So if we're just like working with somebody we find really sexually attractive or just attractive for whatever reasons, and it's really getting in the way of being functional at work, well, just remember that even on, on just on that, you know, I'm not talking about so much being attracted to their wonderful personality and their generous spirit, but just that more basic physical attraction, you know, just remember, and it's skin, flesh, and bones. You can just use anything. I mean, you know what a body is. Your body is much like their body. So by just remembering what it is to have a body, you know, I mean, things like, it uses the toilet. And you now these things can be seemingly, you know, I know it can sound a little off-putting, but uh, I don't know about everyone's mind, but there are times my mind has been really obsessive and it's really nice to have some tools that can cool obsession. And just to realize it's just a body. It's so uh, grounding. And it's so liberating to not be pushed around or driven by these unavoidable forces in our emotional, psychological, physical conditioning. They're just wired in, basically. So we have to, you know, develop creative ways to handle our human life, our body and mind, our heart. So instead of being pushed around by our likes and dislikes, acting them out, and then all the suffering of remorse. So when we do act in ways that are unskillful, I mean, just if we remember all the things we did in high school and in our early adult years and, you know, causing ourselves and others harm and doing stupid stuff around attraction, you know, and then it lives on as remorse. I don't know. I wonder if it's true that, you know, if we, how many, there's a hundred, around a hundred of us, but is there anybody in this group that didn't do something stupid around sexual attraction? Raise your hand. <laughs> how did you get, how did you do that? <laughs> We've all probably made some embarrassing, you know, did some embarrassing stuff and then it lives on as remorse. So it's not, like we're done with it. We're, and then when the memory comes up, it's like, oh, I did that. I said that. I acted this way. Right. So this is the thing. We're developing tools where we can be real in the sense of like, there is attraction. I'm not oblivious to attraction. I'm not oblivious to my likes and dislikes, but I'm not, I'm not as confused by attraction and discuss just to talk about the two extremes because I understand oh yeah that's a conditioned tendency of my mind to see to judge to evaluate my body other bodies in particular ways you know it's the both genetic and cultural these ways we've been conditioned but I have some tools so that I don't feel so pushed around by my conditioning there's a lot more space, a lot, a lot more equanimity. And this is really the transformation of view that we're uh, working on in our practice. And these three uh, meditations that we'll be learning over the next week's anatomical parts, next one's called the elements, where we're deconstructing sensation into just the elemental parts. So yeah, there's heat, and there's coolness, there's hardness and softness, there's smoothness and roughness, there's heaviness and lightness. 
there's a kind of cohesion and there's a flow. There's pressure and there's movement. So there are these different ways we can deconstruct experience. We talk about them as earth, fire, water, and air, because that's kind of how they, their science worked back 2,500 years ago. But it lines up perfectly well because earth just means hard, soft, smooth, rough, heavy, and light. That's the earthiness of sensation. And fire just re refers to temperature, coolness, and warmth. And water is the, the sense of, like when we're feeling sensation, there's a sense of cohesion like it all kind of coheres as this experience of body, right? And then air is that pressure. And sometimes the pressure is, uh, is held and sometimes pressure turns into movement. So that's, the, that's referred to as the air element. And we'll do that guided meditation uh, next Monday night on the elements. And I'll send out some of these, I'll send out the, the traditional um, from the sutta, the description of each of these three meditations. And then the last one I mentioned is imagining the decomposition of the body so that the body born, grows old, dies and falls apart back to dust. I just letting that get grounded, getting grounded in that basic truth. And the idea is that these contemplations help to correct view, how the mind constructs meaning. Because normally the bad habits we have is we take our experience, like the experience of the body, and we see it as a permanent thing, a beautiful thing, something that is in this duality of attractive to unattractive, that, that that's a truth about the body, that it's it exists in this dualistic spectrum from attraction to unattract, not, not attracted. That it's permanent, that it's beautiful, or in this, you know, this uh, spectrum of attraction to non-attraction, that it's personal and that it's satisfactory. And these contemplations will do this for the remaining part of this course. And then also with the feeling tone in the spring course really corrects these things that are called the four distortions. So more and more as we're living our life, just in ordinary ways, we don't imagine things are permanent. We just start more and more to naturally see everything as in motion, changing. We don't imagine things are gonna be satisfactory because nothing totally satisfies this heart. So we, th we just start seeing things as, oh, that will be a nice meal, but it won't be perfectly, permanently satisfactory. I'll feel good for a while, and then it will be over. It's not really going to satisfy me. So we'll still take vacations probably, but we will less and less imagine the vacation is going to satisfy me in any lasting way. So the question of whether I should go, I won't go on vacation because I think it's going to fix me or I won't get married or get involved in a committed relationship because it's going to make me satisfied forever. I'm going to do it because it seems like the skillful thing to do. But I'm not putting this idea, which will always end in betrayal, that it's going to satisfy me. And then even in a deeper way, we stop taking things so personally. And this will, you'll get more of a sense of this with the elements meditation when we really break our physical experience down. Oh yeah, this is just hardness or this is just softness, just smoothness. Even those of you who, you know, like to eat food, which I'm assuming is all of us, you know, just to break it down in terms of taste, saltiness, sourness, crunchiness, softness. Right, it's just these different smoothness, And it, it kind of, it, it sort of takes the mystery. No, 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 I just like it. It's ice cream, you know, it's my favorite. So much of our joy, you know, when we're eating is the idea that I'm the guy who likes this food I'm eating, right? 
But when we deconstruct it into what's actually the experience of chewing and tasting and swallowing, it's just what it is. It's not bad, but it isn't going to save me, you know, having my favorite food or eating something that's not so much my favorite. That's not going to kill me. It's just what it is. It's just that combination of flavor. So this is an age old technique, especially in early Buddhism of deconstructing experience, because when we deconstruct experience, it's very hard for the mind to relate with greed, hatred, and delusion, which are, you know, the three categories of being unskillful, basically. So you can work with that with the uh, body parts contemplation, see how it teases out greed, hatred, and delusion when you realize it's just skin, flesh, and bones. And when you deconstruct the sensations in these four elements way, just see it. There's less of the sense of it, of conceit of it being my bodily experience. No, it's just hardness is being known or softness is being known or heaviness is being known, coldness is being known. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but here in Minnesota, those of us in Minnesota, we're getting serious cold spell, a long cold spell. I think it's gonna go on for another seven days much to my dismay, but it's a great time to notice coldness as just coldness being known. Oh yeah, this is coldness. It's one of the elements, you know? It's the absence of warmth. And then you can even see that some parts of the body are colder. And then the parts that are relatively warm, like it changes our relationship to the coldness to notice the warmth. Just like if things are feeling really hard, the chair you're sitting in feels really hard, notice softness. It changes your relationship to the hardness when you keep in mind softness. So it's really this work with the elements really takes away um, the habit of relating with greed, hatred, and delusion. See if that's true in your own experience as you kind of start to play with these different practices. So I wanted to save a little time to see if there's some questions tonight for the whole group and uh, then also uh, save a few minutes to read a poem before we end at nine. So we have about 13 minutes and uh, I am assuming most of you know how to raise your hand digitally and that way it's nice and order. Um, but if you don't know at the bottom, one way, there's several ways to raise your hand, but one way is you have this thing at the bottom called reactions. If you click on that, you'll see the raise hand and then I'll see your little box will come so I can see that you've raised your hand. And uh, any comments from your practice? Like if you did some of the, the body parts meditation this last week or questions that are emerging, anything related to what I said that you'd like to share with the group? What comes to mind? Too much. Don't be shy about expressing <laughs> whatever your <laughs> whatever your thing was. Katie, would you like to begin? And it could be, of course, many causes for that um, agitation or restlessness, whatever you'd call it. But the and but one possibility is this: you know, we're going against the grain here. And it's not the habit of the mind to want to be just deconstructed in this, to deconstruct the body in this way. So how can you do it in just the right way that the body can tolerate it and really get to know like what the effect is? Because sometimes meditation, certain meditative contemplations, uh, there's a lot of pushback, but then when we're done, it feels really good to have done it. So that's, you want to notice both like, oh, oh yeah, that was really hard to stick with it. But afterwards, it felt like the right thing to have done. It felt like there was some learning, some calming that came from it. So I don't know, did you have any sense afterwards, Katie, how it was? Part of, you know, the other thing about these contemplations, they're 
<clears throat> really strong concentration practices because it's kind of provocative and interesting to the mind. The mind is just doing this one thing. So it's, it's kind of getting concentrated. So that means that everything it experiences, including reactivity, is going to be amplified by the concentration. So these body part, in fact, all of these um, meditations can be used for deep states of absorption because they lend themselves when you hold this in mind. Wynn and I once uh, were able to practice with this amazing meditator, this nun from Burma, Sister Dipankara. I think she's still teaching. She's not that old. Um, we probably practiced with her maybe 15 or 20 years ago, but she was an amazing meditator. But when she was a young girl, who knows from a previous life, that's how she understands it at least, um, from her previous lifetime of meditating, she started to see the skeleton as a meditation object, like this bright image in her mind from all her past work of imagining the skeleton. And this is a common meditative theme in Theravada countries like Burma. And so, and she would, it was like for her the most beautiful image, not that the skeleton itself was beautiful, but the way her mind got concentrated, got unified in the knowing of that image. So this is just an example, like these contemplations can be very concentrating and you wanna be aware of the, the effects of the mind <clears throat> being kind of concentrated and it will, itches will seem bigger. Reactivity will seem bigger, but it may not be that your mind is more reactive or you're having more itches. It may be that you're much more sensitive, much more concentrated. So everything's bigger. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Michelle, did you want to say something? Really, it's a really nice place to end. And I just want to emphasize again that Everybody take responsibility for using these teachings in a way that seem helpful, including just putting them on a shelf somewhere in your heart that you might go back to later. It's really okay. And some of you might feel more like really digging in. Like you might, I mean, it's just to acknowledge how much difficult stuff we have in terms of our own body image. And uh, I mean, I consider myself a very well-practiced person, very sincerely practicing all these years. But if I took all my clothes off and had a full-length mirror, I've always had a skinny body, but now I have a skinny body with a real belly, uh, at least according to my judgment. And, uh, and maybe it stands out more because I'm skinny. But, you know, I'm older and things get flabbier as you get older. And it's like, I, I just, I find it really interesting to look at myself in the mirror and to notice the reactivity in my mind. Like, that's interesting that my mind does that, you know? And just like more nose hairs as I've gotten older, some of you can relate to that. And just the other changes that come with getting older, the, you know, the hairline going further back and, and just to, oh, that's just hair of the head or, lack of hair of the head, or just that, just skin, flesh, and bones. And so just for those of you who feel a little bit more confident, then try some of these things, you know, just looking at your body, looking at other bodies in these fresh, creative, experimental ways. Always in the service of settling and clarity and the movement away from greed, hatred, and delusion. That's the point, not to kind of find new creative ways to hate yourself more <laughs> or to judge yourself more, which is often, you know, unfortunately, we tend to get drawn back into that, those habits of self-judgment or judging others. Um, so be on the lookout for that as you, as you creatively play with this. And I'll just read the last... Uh, few lines from this poem, I Will Keep Broken Things by Alice Walker. You can look up the whole poem if you uh, are interested. I Will Keep Broken Things by Alice Walker. And this is just the last half. I will keep broken things in my house 
there remains an honored shelf on which I will keep broken things. Their beauty is they need not ever be fixed. I will keep your wild, free laughter, though it is now missing its reassuring and graceful hinge. I will keep broken things. Thank you so much. I will keep broken things. I will keep you. Pilgrim of sorrow, I will keep myself. So really nice to be with everybody tonight. Wishing you a fun, interesting, insightful week of practice. And uh, hope to connect with everyone next Monday night. And we'll save the last 20 minutes next Monday for small group work. Take care, everybody.